Hello and welcome to the Iraqi Nutrition Podcast. I'm your host, Juma Iraqi. And today I have with me a very special guest, Martin McDonald. Martin, how are you doing today? Hi, Juma. I'm well, thank you. How are you? I'm fine, thank you very much. Uh, really appreciate that you um, accepted my request to do a podcast. And, okay. and today we're going to talk about meal frequency and timing, and especially breakfast, as I know that's a topic you're really passionate about. <laughs> so before we start, I just want to mention that this podcast is available on YouTube in video format, but you can also listen to the podcast on iTunes and also SoundCloud. So, Martin, before we start with the questions, could you please give us a brief introduction about yourself? Yeah, sure. So, <clears throat> the I suppose the boring stuff is I did my degree and master's in sports science and sports and exercise nutrition, uh, respectively, at Loughborough University. And I actually went on to do another postgraduate in clinical nutrition. And... Um, yeah, my, my career started, I was lecturing uh, for, for a few years whilst also having some clients on the side. I, um, I competed in natural bodybuilding from the age of 18 and as I, I, I presume you know, once you get abs, suddenly everyone thinks you know what you're talking about. So I had a few clients here and there and my, I suppose my big break came when uh, not through, so my background was performance, nutrition, athletes and these kind of things and that's what I'd studied in but I ended up working with a, a kind of minor celebrity from uh, a sitcom or uh, EastEnders it was and she said my name on TV and at the time I just had a one page kind of CV website with my mobile number at the top and basically my phone didn't stop ringing for months on end and um, that's when I set up my consultancy Mac Nutrition and I ended up kind of giving up the day job of lecturing and um, yeah just ended up working with lots and lots of different types of people general population still kept my contracts with um, the uh, GB weightlifting team or British weightlifting so that also includes the Paralympic powerlifting team mm -hmm. and I've held that through to this day so um, it's been a long time been into lots of um, you know, Olympic Games, Commonwealth Games, World Championships with, with those guys. I was actually over in Norway for the Europeans and I, I think we spoke um, yeah. Yeah, at that time. So, yeah, from there I've just gone on and um, I suppose built up a bit of a social media following and, and my passion really, I suppose one of the reasons that I, was, I did lecturing was because it meant that you were guaranteed an audience every week and um, depending on what time of day the lecture was, obviously. So uh, it, the biggest issue for me was the marking. But as I kind of worked more and more, it became that I was doing much more education for um, athletes, even for um, talent development programs. Um, I, was, I led one of my early contracts was with um, England Swimming and their talent development. So working with athletes, all the you know, maybe nine-year-olds all the way up until kind of they would get on the Olympic squad. So lots and lots of education. And I think really I found that's my passion lies in the education stuff. I love reading nutrition research, probably much the same as yourself. And um, yeah, and then just putting that into, I suppose my key thing is public speaking. So I just love being on a stage, being able to talk to people who care what I'm talking about. So yeah. Yeah, it can be a really real energy rush being on stage. So yeah. I know the feeling. But uh, how big is the company now? Now I know Mac, Mac Nutrition is a really big big deal in the UK. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily be, say a big deal, but it's um it's funny. What I spoke at um Body Power Expo this year and ended up sit having dinner with kind of the the head people from there, and um they were asking about the team, and so I think now. We've, with kind of, uh, we've got a placement student who's leaving, but we've got someone who's coming in to replace, and we've had one member of staff leave, but we've got another intern coming in. So, at the minute, it's it was eleven, but it's kind of nine um, individuals now. So, we I suppose we are in a way the biggest in the UK, uh, mm. industry leaders, as it were. But it doesn't feel like that. I always say to people in a relatively small business like mine, mm. um, but in the industry, it's, you know, we've got 
it, when people come to, we have a mentorship program where other nutritionists, dietitians, SNC coaches, personal trainers come. And, and it's really kind of humbling. They're like, oh, if we could only be half as sex, successful as you, it'd be brilliant. And you know, that's really nice. But I still feel like I've got a whole way to go really before I call myself successful. So, yeah. Yeah. But what what made you actually decide to do uh, another degree? Like uh, you know, you mentioned that you had the main interest in performance, and that you did that degree first. What what made you go back and do another degree in clinical nutrition? Yeah, I think you're probably the first person who's ever asked me that. Um, it's quite an interesting story. So I, off the back of, I basically helped this celebrity lose loads of weight, and um, she was this big. Um, news story for months and um, it meant that I ended up getting clients from all realms walks of life thinking that I was someone special and you know all I'd done with her was helped her lose weight um, helped her with her nutrition and back then I was I wasn't I was rubbish at what I did to be quite frank and then um, so she went with a personal trainer I helped her with her nutrition and um, it meant that I yeah, worked with lots of different people who probably thought I was more important and therefore paid me lots of uh, money. And it turned out that I helped this one lady with her nutrition. And she wasn't for weight loss. She actually had some food issues, but she just hadn't got it right. And I simplified it for her. But it turned out that her husband worked, was quite high up in, in Bupa. Are you aware of Bupa? They're like the big health insurance type company in the UK. Uh, in the UK. But I presume they're global but I actually don't know anyway he came and said to me he he was involved in a lot of innovation and they wanted to um they wanted to bring as a health insurance company they did they wanted to be able to actually then help with health so he then brought me on board as a consultant and I thought oh man I'm helping with something quite serious here and really my credentials don't support what I'm doing so at the time, I then started studying as I was on the job and then ended up doing this um, clinical nutrition at Roehampton University. Um, and just on the flip side of that as well, I was, as you'll know, in the world of weight loss, weight loss is such a supporting agent in, in many, many diseases. So, you know, people would get, take up exercise programs because their uh, GP had told them to and then they might have you know, high cholesterol or um, they might be pre-diabetic or something and the, the doctor said, you really need to lose weight. And they would just Google, you know, nutritionist to help them lose weight. I would start working with them. And I thought, I probably need to get a bit more clued up on the clinical side of things if I'm going to start hearing polycystic ovary syndrome and um, type 2 diabetes more often. So it just kind of led me down that road. And I just thought, from a integrity point of view, as a sports nutritionist, I, I what didn't really have, and it's not to say that qualifications are everything, but I just felt I would, it would be doing my dues to get the kind of academic mentoring that you do get at the highest level in a kind of studying. So yeah, that's that's really why I got led down to to doing those kind of things. Interesting. I think it's a great supplement, especially when you work with athletes, but because sometimes you have these sort of cases, especially with, yes. with uh, for example, eating disorders that are very common and uh, can be very difficult to to work with. So I think it's a it's a great thing that you did there, um, yeah. further in your education on the clinical part. Okay, let's let's dive into the questions. And the first question is. When it comes to breakfast, people always say that it's the it's the most important meal of the day. You read these observational studies that links eating breakfast with a healthier lifestyle. But do actually breakfast give an advantage on your uh, on your metabolism? Does it kickstart your metabolism? Yeah. So this you've really gone in at my um, my one of my favorite talking points here. So. The the idea that breakfast is somehow um, magical, I suppose, is really what it comes down to in terms of, oh, it you know boosts your metabolism. Realistically, it 
doesn't boost your metabolism in the way that many, many people would say it does, the way you see on the internet, this, the way you see in many health guidelines. So we know that when you eat, you do get um, through the thermic effect of the different foods that you'll be eating. So you have some cereal with some milk. And it raises your metabolism to some extent, depending on the macronutrient composition of that meal. But the idea that if you skip breakfast, your metabolism will somehow be slower over a 24-hour period or like-for-like like in a calorie-equated scenario is just plain wrong. So I, the main study I draw back to on this is, is one, the Bath Breakfast Study. It was in, I think it was 2014 was the first um, published paper that um, James Betts and his team did down there. And one of their kind of key parts of their summary of their finding of their results was there was no, I think they might have even used the term metabolic adaptation to skipping breakfast. So people's metabolism was no slower through having no breakfast. And you, if I almost, I would like, I challenge people to try and find any paper that shows a slower metabolism because it's, I'm just not sure there is a single paper. I don't know if you've ever heard of this, Juma, but people say you can find a study to prove anything. Mm -hmm. And um, and I'm just like, no, you can't. You you literally cannot find a study to prove anything you want. I mean, there are conflicting views, but I'm not sure anyone would find a study that shows, yeah, greater metabolism with, with eating breakfast. So the there are some... <sighs> There's a small, small amount of evidence that breakfast might be beneficial. And for instance, in the same study by Betts, and I think there's been one, maybe even two follow-up studies that have looked at something similar. And that has been that if you eat breakfast, your physical activity is slightly higher. So, and this is probably subconscious, potentially potentially we can eat um, or NEPA like non-exercise and um, physical activity there's more to be kind of elucidated on that area if if really that's the case and in my opinion I suppose this is my bias is that in these studies it in the real world if someone is very much a case of they have their set routine and you say to them, do eat breakfast or don't eat breakfast. By telling them to not eat breakfast, you don't necessarily change. They're not going to go, oh, I'm going to do less activity. They still have the same routine, walk to the car, drive wherever, walk into the office, these kind of things. And um, we know one of the big things with breakfast is people say, if you skip breakfast, you will overeat later in the day. And it's, you know, it. And therefore, that's why people get become overweight. And then you get the follow ones. And when you eat, your metabolism slower, so you get fat. Or when you eat, um, your body's in starvation mode, so you store more of it as fat. But again, neither of those things are true. There's a there was a study actually funded by um, by Kellogg's, and they they fed people breakfast, <clears throat> and I think it was I'm fairly sure 600 calories of breakfast. And the other group didn't have breakfast. And then they went until lunchtime and then they were given an all-you-can-eat buffet. And obviously it's, uh, you have a, I kind of describe it, you have a little man in a lab coat following you around weighing everything you eat. And essentially they showed that people who had skipped breakfast over ate by um, 15% compared to those who had had breakfast. But the average consumption of, of lunch was 1,000 calories. So the study concluded, quite in my opinion, unethically but not illegally, concluded that if you skip breakfast, you overeat at lunch. But when you look at the calorie balance, which we know is what matters, you know, we're looking at 600, 1,600 calories if you ate breakfast, but actually only 1,150 if you skip breakfast. So it's, uh, you know, you have to look a little bit deeper into the research than just what the kind of Kellogg's funded study, show, you know, put in there because this was all over the newspapers in the UK um, that you know skipping breakfast and you overeat and you're more likely to become fat and it's like that is that simply isn't the case. Um, 
I just want to say at this point, people always think I'm trying to say you shouldn't eat breakfast. And that is 100% not what, I, not what I'm saying. It's a case of there are many people who don't wake up hungry and they, and by forcing them to eat, you could well be pushing them into a calorie surplus or not helping them be in a calorie deficit. And a lot of what people's advice around breakfast becomes is behavior change, mindful eating, which I think mindful eating is pretty much one of the next big buzzwords within the industry. It's all of the things that we do, even as evidence-based practitioners, <clears throat> I find a little bit the whole protein consumption. We Protein has so many benefits, but it's almost like we can get a little bit too far that way. A, I don't know if you've seen, like, I think, is it Mars bars? Now they have Mars protein. Yeah. Um, the idea that the protein in that bar is somehow going to outweigh the mindless eating of, you know, very highly processed, very palatable food is, is misguided if anyone goes that route. Now, I'm sure they taste great. And, you know, a lot of protein bars are basically just Mars bars. But um, I think a lot of the, this area of us telling people to eat, eat a chicken breast because it's going to boost your metabolism and satiate you more on these kind of things. And actually, we're just creating a mind mindful person who thinks, you know, they have to go and prepare that or go specifically a bit further in the supermarket to buy it, rather than just, what am I going to eat? Uh, a bag of crisps or some chocolate. Um, so a lot of the breakfast stuff is, no, you must eat breakfast. And therefore, your client or your athlete, your general population, they go, oh, okay, I'm going to get up a bit earlier, I'm going to eat breakfast, and it gives them a good start to the day mentally. But So therefore, they're a bit more, oh, I've, it's a small win. But if you say to your client, actually, you can choose, but I want you to be prepared. The first time you eat, I want it to be good food that you've mindfully chosen um, and, and is you know, balanced, for, to give a really sort of simple term. That's also mindful eating. And that's being, having that tool in your toolbox of not forcing someone into your little box of breakfast is the most important meal of the day. You must eat breakfast is um, for me um, because also I haven't always thought this. When I graduated um, from my master's, I was telling people, and this is why I say a lot of qualifications aren't you know the be all and end all because I graduated from a master's from you know a reputable university saying you should eat breakfast. When I was a bodybuilder, I ate breakfast. That got me lean. Um, and it just, why did I say that? Well, because everyone knows, you know, in inverted commas, everyone knows you should eat breakfast. But when I bothered to look at the research, actually, I didn't have a great deal of evidence for what I was saying. If someone wants to lose weight, um, they want to fast a little bit in the morning, there isn't strong evidence that says they shouldn't do that or they're going to get suboptimal results. And actually, there's evidence to show maybe they'll get better results um, if, if it helps them adhere or, you know, all of these kind of things. So I just feel like the whole breakfast thing is just full of myths and misconceptions. Um, so, yeah, that's a very long-winded answer to your question. Yeah, but I, I, I totally, totally agree with you. And another thing that I've observed with, with, uh, with clients and... Uh, when in people in general is that they think that breakfast is between like this it's between six and eight so if you don't eat between six and eight it's not breakfast anymore so i have had clients that work uh, night shifts and they usually eat at maybe at one or two o'clock in the uh, in the afternoon and they say i don't eat breakfast and i said uh, why not because they wake up so late in the day and i'm like First meal of the day is still breakfast. It doesn't matter really when it is. But one thing that I wanted to touch on when it comes to breakfast is you mentioned that your your general recommendation is not that you shouldn't eat breakfast, but it shouldn't be forced on people as well. Do you person have you personally experienced with with clients yourself that some individuals are do just fine with not eating breakfast while some other people might um, overcompensate have you experienced that yourself with yeah. clients so <clears throat> we we do get um 
this is one of the benefits, I suppose, now of working in a team because nutrition is very much kind of lots and lots of individuals working. Now we get to see, we have client case study meetings. So I'm fortunate that I get to see all of my staff's clients' information and these kind of things. And, um, you know, we discuss them and we just see this massive range and it just, it, it, it just goes back to what, we're all kind of realizing that people are so different and it's very hard to box people and differential responses to so many different things. And, and the people who are a bit wacky are starting to go, yeah, let's genetically test people and give them the diet based on that, which is they're, they're jumping the gun by many, many, many years. Yeah. But just understanding as a practitioner that, that actually your biggest skill is your interviewing technique, your consultation process, trying to draw out information, not using leading questions, um, giving really open questions, building rapport so people just open up and tell you their preferences. We, we laugh about, um, not in a bad way, but we laugh about clients when they say to us, oh, I, I don't eat breakfast, I know I should. And then, you know, it's just like, oh, it's another one that said that. And the look on people's faces when you say, you actually you don't have to and they're like really and then even that gets some buy-in but we uh, I have had clients where I have believed for whatever reason because of something I've seen within their uh, pre-consultation form or within their initial consultation that that a windowed eating kind of protocol where they might skip breakfast would be beneficial for them and I've kind of questioned around it and They've said, I wake up starving, hungry. And I thought, oh, maybe, maybe I've um, got this wrong. And um, I, it's happened two ways. Some of them, because of we know things about rhythms within the body, kind of circadian rhythms, and um, even just um, appetite hormone release tends to be in a rhythm. And actually, you can change that rhythm with the rhythm of your eating. So... If someone just pushes their breakfast back, they will wake up less hungry in some people. However, I, I can, I'm thinking of one specific instance where in one lady, we pushed her breakfast back from, it was about, I can't actually remember what time, but I'm going to say 8 o'clock. We managed to push it back to about 11.30 and um, she just wasn't adapting. She was just starving hungry in the morning, no matter what. And um, with her, we just went, you know what, it's, it's going to impact adherence. It's, you're not enjoying it, so we just knocked it on the head. And she's actually one of very few that I can think of who haven't adapted to being able to push it like that. Some people, you say to them, you could try this, and they go, oh, I went until 2 p.m. and I didn't even think about food. And they were just fine. And I'm personally one of these people, which I suppose why I do have the bias towards it, that when I, I did a kind of very strict intermittent fasting, like I live my life skipping breakfast, so I intermittent fast. Mm -hmm. I went very kind of <clears throat> detailed with it, very um, specific. And I, some days I would go until 7 p.m. and I'd even train, fasted at that late time, and then start eating. And I became really good at not eating. But as soon as I ate, I couldn't stop. Mm -hmm. um, but when I say I couldn't stop, I still managed to stay in a calorie deficit because when you're only eating between 8 p.m. and midnight, I was eating two huge meals and, you know, maybe coming in between 2,000, 2,500 calories and being able to lose weight. And um, that was kind of my goal at the time. So we do find very different responses from people, but it's also understanding that even if someone reports being hungry, in many, many people, we've been able to shift that hunger and actually they've felt so much better just delaying breakfast because it's been a smaller window then they get busy at work another thing just to note is that hunger does come in peaks and troughs so when people have skipped meals they're oh, I'm really hungry and then you say just just kind of mull that over half an hour and then see what you're like oh yeah the hunger subsided and actually I managed to get until half past 12 and then I, I started my breakfast at lunchtime mm -hmm. and um so yeah, I think it's it's certainly not something that we um, force on people, but having it as a tool, um, as I said, is helpful. 
The other thing that I just wanted to touch on, because I feel like it linked to something I said earlier, is if you tell someone that they must eat breakfast or they must eat at a specific time, a bit like you said, people think breakfast is in this funny time period. Actually, in studies, I've seen them start to use 11 a.m. If you don't eat before 11 a.m., you've missed breakfast. So it's a really funny definition. Mm -hmm. We obviously know breakfast is breaking the fast. So, you know, smart Alex on the internet say, oh, if you skip breakfast and if you never had breakfast, you'd die. You know, it's like, oh, well done. Um, so the, the idea that, okay, you must have breakfast, it may be that some highly compliant clients go, oh, yeah, I can do that. I'm going to be more mindful. I'm going to wake up early. The, the issue is, is if life gets in the way, and we all, I think I'm becoming a lot more moderate in my views in that when I was a student and I was a bodybuilder, I was obsessed and everyone else came second to my, um, to my training and my nutrition. But when you, when you work with adults, um, not students and not bodybuilders, things do get in the way. And actually, the issue with that is, is if they then miss breakfast, it's an it's they've lost they've failed and you basically set them up with a failure attitude for that day and you can do your best to try and coach them into oh it doesn't matter on that one occasion just get back on the wagon but actually if you teach them they've not fallen off that the wagon they've made a positive conscientious action of oh i'm not having breakfast today my first meal is going to be at this time or whenever i, I can get it but it's going to consist of these foods it's it's a, it's a lot easier to get adherence and positive results with clients um, in that way. Yeah, it's, uh, like teach, teach them to have like a dyna dynamic system instead of a black and white system. I think that's the, like that's the key issue when you work with nutrition. And that's also what I try to teach my students is that you have different tools for different clients and if one client wakes up at seven and they're not hungry until nine, then eat at nine. It's like, it's that simple sometimes to just give, give an answer. But I've also experienced that people that come to see a nutritionist, they usually fear telling you, like you said, they actually fear telling you that they don't eat breakfast and, and, and stuff like that. And I also gave, get the same surprise reaction from them when i say okay if you if you're not hungry and when you wake up just wait a couple of hours and then eat when you when you feel like it so yeah. so i think people miss the the big picture yeah so but if like over to something else like if 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 you have a client that's really interested in optimizing his his results when it comes to body composition does it really matter uh, does he have to eat like every two to three hours does it is there a minimum of, of meals he should get in during the day mm. yeah so it, yeah it's a good segue i suppose one of the things i focused a little bit maybe on health metabolism fat loss there one of the things that i often get asked surrounding either breakfast skipping or is is the meal frequency it obviously it tends to reduce if you intermittent fast so yeah you're not necessarily once you start eating you could maybe eat every three hours but you've missed a meal so i think one key thing in this area is i there's not as far as i know there's no evidence to show that skipping breakfast you you would gain any less muscle how be simply because you're missing one meal out of a possible four, five, six, seven, however many people can fit in a day these days. Mm. So I think it depends on your interpretation of the data and what you believe is driving muscle gain from a nutritional perspective. And my personal interpretation is probably if we had the the tools to measure and and also the you know the subjects to adhere to something perfectly and you know we could put them in a lab and no other variables my 
My interpretation of the data, and I, I'm going to say belief, is that by skipping breakfast, you probably will end up with less muscle, you know, over 10 years, over, you know, 3,000 days worth of, you know, you'll have eaten 3,650 less breakfasts, let's say. So 3,650 less opportunities to um, hit a leucine threshold and stimulate protein synthesis, for instance. Now, I don't think ever in our lifetime we're going to be able to measure the difference between eating five meals a day and six meals a day. But mechanistically, we can potentially assume that because you have stimulated protein synthesis um, a sixteenth less, I don't know if my maths is failing me, but roughly, um, the, that you will therefore, and that's not a sixteenth less gains, uh, before anyone pulls me up on that, but it, but it's one less opportunity. So going back to your specific question of someone who's really, and it's cool that you kind of put even context into your question, but someone who's really, really trying to optimize. So I think we're in a time of um, the nutrition uh, lifetime, or whatever you want to call it, era, where people are a little bit, ah, it doesn't matter, um, you can just do anything, mm-hmm. and um, which, depending on where you are at the time point, you can go, yeah, I agree, or I'm getting annoyed of that now because I'm trying to be a bit more specific. But anyway, so for someone who's trying to be really specific, they're not general public, they're doing everything they can to try and optimize either um, body fat or muscle mass. The, the meal frequency one is a case of, there, there is one study, and I actually can't remember the author, which is annoying, but they com- you may even know it, but they compared six meals to, per day versus two. Mm-hmm. And they actually showed a slightly, a very small beneficial um, impact on body composition with six versus two. And I know a lot of people criticized it of, well, you know, whoever eats two meals a day, you know, n- no intermittent fasting protocols. I mean, even when I mentioned there, when I was eating it, when I was training around seven and eating then, I would still have a shake after my training session. So it's not a meal, but I was eating for all purposes. I was eating. Then I eat a meal 90 minutes later. Then I might eat another meal three hours after that before I go to bed. So I was getting three time points of protein synthesis. So um, the the idea that um, six versus two, those are really kind of different. Um, in terms of fat loss, I suppose the thing, uh, you know, weight loss, fat loss, I am very much of the opinion that there is no difference in someone who is metabolically healthy there is no difference in how many meals you have a day so you could eat every two hours every four hours every six hours every 12 hours once a day and really the difference in your fat loss if calories are equated will be virtually zero now there might be tiny tiny differences um there are some studies um i think it's stoat Um, in 2007 they compared one meal versus three meal per day three meals per day and they they did show us some differential changes in I think waist circumference was one I think weight loss was greater significantly but actually body fat was didn't reach significance but it was something like um, 11% change versus 9% something like that if I can recall but they they did see this small difference. So in those studies, you've always got the issues of, well, if they're eating all of their calories in one meal, are they managing to finish that full meal? Or um, is there slightly is there a slightly different adherence because of it? And these kind of things. So in my opinion, if you can accurately um, match calories, it really, really does not matter if you eat every two hours, three, four, five. Now, from a body composition and muscle mass point of view, there probably is a small advantage, and I mean small, to maybe going to a higher um, number of meals per day um, and therefore looking at maybe, you said two to three there, and I, and I know there's this whole stoke your metabolism by eating little and often. So that is not true. Um, 
Again, that's another one. Try and find a study that supports that idea. It's just not there. Um, there's there's uh, nibbling versus gorging studies. And I think nibbling studies have gone up to 13 meals a day uh, versus one. And they showed no difference in uh, metabolism. They showed no difference in, I think, in, is it, did they measure body temperature as a measure of metabolism? I'm not sure. But either way, no difference. So, but in terms of, where are we trying to hit in terms of meal frequency for optimal body composition? Somewhere between three and seven, maybe four and seven. Uh, it, it, it is in that, those ranges. I actually um, delivered on one of our mentorships recently. And I did this whole thing. We talked about refractory periods, leucine thresholds, um, protein timing, all of these different things, talking about muscle gain. And I gave them the summary slide and I said, so basically what I'm telling you is what the Arnold Schwarzenegger era of bodybuilders were doing was just about right. But I've managed to get you to pay me money to, for me to tell you that. And it's just, it's, yeah, because it, they, lo they love it, they, the same as me, um, geeking out on the science. But it's, nothing has changed that drastically. We still know you need some, so I think in the evidence-based crowd, there has, I don't know if you've seen this at all, but a bit as long as you hit total protein it just doesn't matter have you seen that kind of thing said yeah yeah um and like i i categorically refute that in terms of it it may be that um there isn't really really strong evidence but you know even i've i've mentioned that study with the six versus two meals if if you eat all of your protein whatever let's say a hundred and 60 grams a day in one meal versus splitting it into four for the same amount of protein mechanistically and i mean based on a few studies we we can say that you're probably going to gain more muscle because you've got more um time periods where you you are stimulating muscle protein synthesis so i think where that has come from is a little bit of the idea of people caring more about nutrient timing than they care about the things that really, really do matter, like um, protein, uh, total protein. So it's like, oh, someone's eating um, 80 grams of protein a day at a body weight of 80 kilos, and some are going, make sure some of those 80 grams go immediately after your training session mm -hmm. before they just go actually, do you know what? You should probably bump your protein up a little bit if you're really trying to gain a lot of muscle mass. So I think that's where people have swung a little bit too far and said, it's total protein. That's all that matters. Yeah. And, and I think that ignores a lot of, of what we know now. So yeah, in terms of if someone wants to optimize body composition, just to summarize again, another long answer, it, I think that the party line of, roughly every three to four hours for both muscle mass or, or really just for muscle mass and then as long as you've got your calories set where you need them to be then then it's all good um for me i forego one of my meals in the morning so yeah i don't get as many but that allows me to be happy but also have calories where i want them to be on, on a roughly daily basis excellent and uh, when, when we're on the subject I think there was a study in, I think it from, I don't remember the author, I think the author was Ar Aretta from 2011 oh, or 12. Eight. They eight. took 80 grams and did two meals, four meals or eight meals. And yeah. they actually saw better results with the four meals because I think eight, eight meals had 10 grams, four meals had 20 and uh, two meals had 40. So they saw actually better gains from the four meals than the other the other group. Yeah, so yeah. so it's saying that all total protein is only the only thing that matters is 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 not correct in my it's opinion yeah. I, I think I think the point that you you're, you're trying to say is that you you have to get the basics first you have to get like if, if you're gonna look like people say oh I'm trying to lose weight and I'm eating healthy you can eat healthy, but you could still overeat on calories, yeah, yeah. and it won't matter. So the same thing, th same thing goes here. If <laughs> if you're trying to build muscle, it doesn't really matter if you take that protein shake or if you take all those supplements. If you haven't got your 
total calorie that your calories in the surplus and that total protein is in place and the meal frequency then maybe we can look at the timing of of the meal so and that's where i think the fitness industry nowadays have gone from this end to the other end that it used to be really important and now it doesn't matter anymore it's just about if you have everything else in place those small benefits that you can get might come more important in my opinion mm. so and it and uh, one thing that's actually bugging me with with the with the um, nutrient timing is that nowadays if you drink a protein shake after you work out it's like it's like some some people look at you like you're you're an idiot and you're actually doing something that's not beneficial like it's it's not going to have a detrimental effect to drink a protein shake after training but it's no. probably less important than the <clears throat> other stuff mm, it's re- it's funny that reminds me of a a meme so you know these pictures with yeah. um it's like i think there's a woman preparing a meal and there's a kind of jack guy shouting at her and it, and then it says something like um uh has a go at his girlfriend f- for um for uh eating little and often and then underneath it says only started intermittent fasting yesterday and it's just like oh yeah you're such an idiot and it's like hold on i saw you drinking a protein shake last week and then they've gone and read i don't know if like the Alan Aragon Schoenfeld kind of review on meal timing. I think some people probably extrapol- extrapolated that further than Alan or Brad would have probably said themselves. Mm-hmm. And um, so it's just like, it doesn't matter. Uh, you don't need to have a protein shake after training. Interestingly, I mean, I suppose in a way in their study, it was like, it doesn't, you know, if you've eaten a couple of hours before, you've still got amino acids in the blood. For me, um, what we know about kind of triggers so it's not just a case of you can you can mainline amino acids into your bloodstream through a um you know cannula and you can have amino acids jacked up really high and protein synthesis still switches off and we know that with you know refractory periods we need um you know kind of essentially a rise and fall or at least a change in concentration of we now know it's leucine for the for these things to happen so actually people saying oh it i do like the idea that is being pushed that it doesn't matter as much as people say so i know there's some pro bodybuilders i'm not going to name any names but um who put who kind of put themselves out there nutrition experts and they say if i went to the gym and i didn't have my protein shake i'd just go home and i kind of i'm like well you're an idiot because (laughs) training is the key thing that's going to have a big impact. And then, you know, secondly, you could have the protein shake when you get home and not have lost all your gains or anything like that. So um, I do like that there's a, an emphasis that's been taken off it to some extent. But we, we also know from um, the studies that look at like the anabolic window that actually, yeah, we now the, know that the anabolic window lasts 24 plus hours or at least this sensitization to amino acid feeding but if you look at the graphs the further away they test from the training session the smaller the augmentation uh, of the protein synthetic response is so actually there might still i i personally if someone wants to do everything right i would tell them not to wait two three hours until they had protein after training i'd say if there's no reason not to Get it in soon after. And I hate putting a time on it because what's soon? Well, if it's convenient to have it 15 minutes after. So for me, I would always have taken my shake to the gym to have it there. But now we know it matters less. I will drive home. But I, I live seven minutes from the gym. So I'll get home and then I, you know, I won't worry if it's taken me half an hour to have that shake. But it's still half an hour. That's still very soon in the grand scheme of things. So people saying... Oh, you know, I'd happily, I'd go to the shops, do some shopping and then come back and I wouldn't eat for three hours. And in my mind, if you're trying to do everything right, it's not going to make a great deal of difference. And actually, because that person's got better genetics than me, they'll look loads better than me anyway. However, 
they might be able to be a little bit better by having by paying more attention to nutrient timing and understanding that yeah they'll still pa- have amino acids in their blood but actually post training they need a trigger to send muscle protein synthesis up so um I can't remember how we got onto that, but yeah, it's a cool discussion to have. Yeah, yeah. And uh, one thing that I want to mention in regards to the Schoenfeld and Aragon study is that if you actually listen to lectures from Brad and from Alan, what they really tell you is that if you're if you're a person that's, for example, trying to lose weight and weightlift two or three hours. Having a lot of focus on nutrient timing is probably not where you should put your energy. But if you're a guy that tries to maximize your 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 gains and your results, and you're doing everything else correct, it's probably a good idea to to get to to have more focus on the nutrient timing. So it's like you said, it's 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 really taken out of context, and people just went from this end to the other end and said it was important. Now it's not important anymore, and that's the sad thing about nutrition because it usually goes that way. People miss like the gray areas yeah. and uh, forget to put to look at it into into context with what people you actually are working with. Mm. I say this all the time. Just I am sure that it's just human nature. People love extremes. There is no. I'm not sitting in the middle. I am either one end or the other. And and actually in an industry where a lot of people are trying to make money it's loads better to be extreme than balanced so it yeah people just swing that way and then as well when someone swings all the way over to the left hand side of saying this that and the other the natural response even as someone in the middle is to go a little bit further to the right to to show how silly they are but actually it pushes you off the you know, off complete balance, you end up saying, no, sugar can't make you fat. Sugar, there's nothing wrong with sugar, you know, with everyone saying sugar's toxic and these kind of things. You end up kind of defending sugar. But actually, a year earlier, you were telling your clients, yeah, you know, sugar's probably something that we could look at. And, you're, you know, you do drink, you know, soft drinks all day long and eat lots of sweets. And you're trying to moderate it, but then you're almost trying to push your clients. Look, my clients can lose weight eating um, sugary food. So I think it, it's it's so difficult, and I think it's it's something that if people want to be evidence based, you just need to be really aware of the messages you put out. If you're trying to bust myths, and this is, I suppose, that's why I do the thing with breakfast. Is as early as I feel appropriate, I say to people. I am not telling you breakfast is bad. I'm not telling you that skipping breakfast will lead to weight loss. I'm telling you that the idea that you must eat it is wrong. So, you know, trying to stay firmly very centered and um, and not just going, no, well, I skip breakfast. Look at me. I've got better abs than that person who eats breakfast. You know, these kind of things. It's just... Yeah, I do think it's it's a bit of human nature to go to the extremes, but yeah. Yeah, and I totally agree with with what you were saying in regards to like if you look at the flexible dieting and if it fits your macro score, it almost seems like uh, the goal is to get in as much processed and unhealthy food as they can, and yeah. that's really not the concept. The concept is that you're flexible enough that if you have the small piece of cake or if you have that small chocolate on a Thursday, you're you're not off your diet and you haven't really done a lot of damage, but it it can be damaging if if you have a black and white mentality and think, okay, I ate the chocolate, I'm not following my meal plan, I might as well just binge eat from from Thursday evening to Monday and start my diet all over again. And that's a tip, <laughs> typical thing to do. So, um, I think people miss miss a bit of the concept, and that's why I also think that people that don't really understand flexible dieting are really critical uh, about it. I actually have an article on my website called uh, "Pop Tarts and Ben and Jerry's," where yeah. I go into these what people actually think about it and what what the concept really really is. Yeah. So, next question is. Um, there's, there seems to be uh, some discussions the last couple of years on what type of uh, 
sources you eat during different times of the day. For example, there have been some claims that if you eat protein and fats at breakfast, it will um, upregulate fat oxidation, so it might be beneficial for, uh, for body composition. What's, what's your thoughts on, about that? Yeah, um, so this is it's funny. I um, I think I got this question. I I'm gonna say used to because we haven't actually released a um, podcast for maybe nine months, and we kind of haven't spoken. But I I had a podcast. I'm not even sure if you're aware of it because I don't know how long you've been following me. But it's called Real Nutrition Radio, and basically this was we we did a whole thing on this. Um, it's myself and a dietitian who um host our, we sort of co-host it and um, we we did a big section on this and I think it came off the back of um, someone hearing an interview and basically it was this idea that if you don't eat any carbohydrate let's say at breakfast and you eat a fat and protein based breakfast that because of that you would accentuate kind of fat oxidation and therefore this would lead to better body composition changes over the course of the day and um and am i kind of on the right lines of where your que- where your question yeah um so and there's there's two things with this one the relatively well-known individual who I believe said this and sparked it off was basing this off and I think he even cited the study and so I had to go and look it up and think you know what where's this come from because he's managed to cite it you see people saying all sorts of silly things about um, belly button rings stopping you using um, abdominal fat and crazy things like that but they, they don't bother citing a study but this individual cited this study so I went and looked it up and it was a study in rats and I thought and you know and no other study in um, humans was showing these you know beneficial body composition changes um, so that's kind of I suppose that's where it's come from a little bit the second thing just to point out um, and I've actually thought of a third facet to this. The the second thing to point out is this idea that <sighs> acute changes or transient s- changes in oxidation of substrates are somehow largely linked to your body composition are, are misguided. So you know you can talk about the whole fasted training thing well if you if you're a non athlete uh if you're you're an unfit male basically and you train fasted your respiratory exchange ratio um the amount of fat that you oxidize during that session will probably be higher because of the absence of carbohydrate now we know from the performance side of things that um training with low carbohydrate availability might have some things that can increase performance but from a body composition standpoint the majority of studies that have looked at this have shown different things such as when you don't when you train fasted you um you train less hard and therefore your uh, expenditure is lower when you um train fasted and you burn a, you oxidize more fat during that 50 minute session your oxidation rates over the other whatever i just said 23 hours and 10 minutes of the day balance out so that you're net equal and actually nothing is changing the fact that energy balance is the key thing in body composition um so there's that key um thing to bear in mind when people start going on about oh i oxidize more fat well actually you need to be in a negative fat balance over the day to be losing fat and that's going to essentially come down to calorie balance and to a much 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 smaller extent oxidation rates so when you do extreme studies like the whole um, metabolic study where they put fat through the floor and they jammed car- they had carbohydrates very high or they did lower carb higher fat in that study it was confounded by the fact that one group probably tapped into their glycogen stores and over a very short study 
it was like, oh, very low fat diets are better for fat loss. But that's irrelevant um, because it was 24 hours and you know the confounding variable was obvious. But going back to this question, the idea that removing carbohydrates from from breakfast so that you're in a fat burning state for longer is is misguided. It, I don't want to say it's wrong because that's my third facet. And um, but most people who are saying, yeah, eat, you know, I don't know, meat and nuts for breakfast. Is that something that you have come across? Yeah. Polish so like. Wine. Yeah, so the whole eat and nut breakfast thing, again, it's like, oh, this is going to change your neurotransmitters. And you've got 21-year-old personal trainers in some big chim chain saying, yeah, I'm going to change your neurotransmitters. Like, okay, name a neurotransmitter. You don't know what you're talking about. You've just heard someone say it and, um, but oh, but my clients lose weight. Yeah, and what else are you doing with them? They're now paying you you know, a hundred pounds an hour to train four times a week and you've also put them on a zero carb diet and they're in a massive energy deficit. Oh no, it's because of the meat and nuts. It's absurd. So, <clears throat> however, the final facet I just want to bring up is, um, and I, I, I was going to make a joke about this, like, and this is my new ebook, but I'm not about to write an ebook. I've got time. Um, but <clears throat> I've made jokes about the whole carb backloading and carb front loading and then I said oh well, my ebook's going to be called carb side loading <laughs> and um, <clears throat> I've actually coined this term a little bit just in a kind of seminars that I've done in talks and I've called it carbohydrate bunching and you know it's not a very sexy term but we'll see we'll see when someone goes and steals it and you see people talking about it on, on Facebook but the carbohydrate bunching <clears throat> What I've drawn from this is even the studies that carbohydrate backloading enthusiasts cite don't support carbohydrate backloading. They support carbohydrate bunching. And I'll explain what it is in a minute. At the same time, the meat and, nut, meat and nuts breakfast crowd are supporting carbohydrate bunching. They are not necessarily supporting um yeah, I suppose they are carb backloading. And on the flip side, people who say, you know, eat carbs at breakfast and don't eat carbs at night, um, they're your carb front loaders. But they also support this carbohydrate bunching. So what the research shows <clears throat> is this really small but really interesting thing of removing carbohydrates from a portion of the day. So... There's, there's quite a few studies um, that support breakfast eating that essentially have shown, okay, a big breakfast with limited carbohydrates at night. Um, there was another one. Let me see because it's quite a good study. Um, it might be Jacob. Uh, but if people want to ask, I'm happy to, to find and post it. But essentially, they showed that a heavy carb breakfast and a heavy protein dinner, again, had favorable impacts on body composition. And um, so that's even flipping on his head. We're talking about carbohydrate lunches and protein dinners. But you've got all of these different studies that like the SOFA study, um, which showed that lots and lots, I think it was 70 plus percent of carbohydrates eaten in evening meals showed favorable body composition changes versus carbs spread out through the day. That's one of the carb backloading studies. And that study hasn't showed that carbs backloaded are better than front loaded. It's shown that carbs in a, in a bunched fashion are better than them evenly spread throughout the day. And then again, we need to understand the context. These individuals are not metabolically healthy. They are not fitness competitors. They are not bodybuilders. So my um, caveat for all of this is I think if, you are, if you're a highly functioning individual in terms of you train hard, you've got a you know, low-ish level of body fat um, and therefore potentially you have good insulin sensitivity because of your resistant training and low levels of body fat. Um, <clears throat> You know, you are genetically on that spectrum where you are healthy. You know, some people don't have to do that much wrong and they become type 2 diabetic and they are unfortunate in the kind of genetic pool. But you're one of those individuals. A lot of what I'm alluding to here, I think, makes absolutely no difference. Like the whole meal frequency, 
um, you know, protein doses, um, this um, nutrient timing of carbohydrates close to training or whatever, they probably make no difference. I'm going to go there. No difference. But if you are one of these individuals where you are potent, you are overweight, and a lot of these studies are done in overweight individuals, um, that I've just thought of another study where they essentially did a Mediterranean diet. But what this Mediterranean diet, what these researchers decided, the Mediterranean diet is obviously just people make up whatever they want it to be. They decided the Mediterranean diet was only coffee for breakfast. And then they had um, kind of meals later in the day, but equated calories over the day. But what all of these studies seem to show is that in these overweight um, you know, BMIs of 30, 35 plus, that they have these small, even with calories as equated as we can assume in the studies, beneficial changes in body composition. So they drop a little bit of body fat, seemingly independent of any major changes in um, energy balance. And this this change is, is so small that it's almost worthless in the grand scheme of things like adherence get that right calorie balance get that right but if you've got someone who's really really on it and they have maybe even someone maybe a bodybuilder who's just bulked up loads and they've got become really overweight actually removing carbohydrates from a small portion of the day either breakfast or lunch or dinner we know that removing carbohydrates is or I say we know, there's evidence to suggest that the removal of carbohydrates initiates some of the um, metabolic responses of fasting. So actually, it's not necessarily the re removal of calories overall, it's the removal of carbohydrates. And I suppose the train low, compete high type research, uh, carbohydrate availability research supports this because we know you can train having eggs or whey protein and still get these um, <clears throat> downstream genetic like gene transcription um, kind of changes so yeah it's it's a it's very complex and the word that I'm going to use is nutrient partitioning and I suppose that's the only thing that could explain these very small benefits of actually yeah removing carbohydrate from maybe breakfast but you could remove it from lunch you could remove it from dinner and actually one small um, nuance of the studies is that <clears throat> putting your carbohydrates closer to where you are more insulin sensitive, i.e. post-training or early in the day, might be very, very, very slightly more optimal. Um, so again, that's kind of going back to that nutrient timing. It doesn't matter for most people, but if someone's you know, really on it, you've got a personality type in a client who actually giving them this little thing will drive them harder. It won't confuse them. Maybe focusing a bit more on nutrient timing for fat loss even. Um, you know, meal frequency, stuff it, makes no difference. Uh, but actually carbohydrates are at, in those periods and having a one window throughout your day so you bunch your carbohydrates, either bunch them at the beginning of the day, breakfast, lunch, bunch them at the end of the day, lunch and dinner, or you know your snacks, or beginning of the day and end of the day, and have your middle of your day free. Um, yeah, it that that's the kind of top end advanced forum discussion type stuff um, on that. Excellent. All right, Martin. Thank you so much for uh, agreeing to this uh, to do this uh, podcast. I think it was great Thanks. to do all a discussion on all these questions. Um, where can people people find more information about you? Yeah, so um, I, I suppose the main I hang out a lot on social media. So um, my Facebook page, you can just Martin McDonald, and you'll see me on there. Um, our macnutrition.com is my consultancy so that's our website and it links through to our again our facebook page for mac nutrition uh, i'm also on twitter as at martin nutrition and uh, my personal website martin macdonaldcom is actually about to be redone never visit that website on a mobile phone that's all i'm saying um, but on a web browser you can go there i've got a, a free ebook there where people can go and download. Um, it's called, I think it's called 
intermittent fasting to get to single digit body fat levels, um, something like that anyway. But one of the things, if people do want to go in there and I can give you the, the link to, to post up, but I'm going to be releasing, um, a couple of lectures that I've done recently, one on hormones. So about testosterone, thyroid, and insulin, and what you need to know for optimal, um, fat loss and muscle gain and then another one very specifically actually on nutrient timing so those are full lectures with lecture slides and everything so if people want to go and stick their email address in there and we'll send them um, those free lectures uh, yeah excellent all right Martin once again thank you thank you so much for taking the time and um, maybe we can do another podcast another time on a different topic yeah, no, I'd uh, I'd like to do that. I've um, one of the things that I can't believe I've not plugged it actually. I'm starting this new um, course, education certification in nutrition actually. So if people want to look that up as well, it's um, a 12 month online course. We, I mean, it's been amazingly well received actually so far. We've got people on four continents doing it. I'm not sure if we've got anyone in Norway. I should check that. Yeah. But um, <clears throat> we uh, got Dubai, Kuwait. New Zealand, Australia, Canada, and um, yeah, it's a 12-month online nutrition course, and um, there'll be lots of content within there that'll get me buzzing, and um, I'll be posting about that, so yeah, I'd, I'd love to come back on and talk about that, but that's mac-nutritionuni.com, so uni for um, UNI. Excellent. That's, that's I'll, cool. put a, I'll put a link in the, in the description for, for all the, the website and, and links. Okay, Thanks. okay, Martin. Have a nice day and hope uh, ho hope we speak soon again. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you. Bye-bye.